be yeah uh hi everyone thank you very much for joining for this uh tc 105 uh, seminar series i'm just going to share my screen describing a little bit about this particular uh, seminar series so um hope you see my screen So this seminar series uh, originated from the discussion within the TC-105, ISSM GETC-105, Geomechanics from Micro to Macro. And we thought that it would be good to have a discussion on discrete element method in geotechnical engineering education. Um, we have five lectures uh, scheduled for this particular seminar series. Uh, lecture one we already had uh, by uh, was given by Francois Gillard, Dr. Francois Gillard, uh, on February eighth, and we will upload this particular presentation lecture on YouTube sometime soon. So, so uh, if you miss it, if you have missed it, uh, please uh, look at that uh, particular YouTube. Again, this particular uh, Dr. Benji Marks um, presentation will be also recorded, and then uh, it will be available through the YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Benji Marks is uh, a lecturer at University of Sydney, and uh, you can see lecture one and lecture two come from the Sydney group, where they've been doing a lot of uh, using DEM for their teaching, and therefore, uh, actually, as yes, is a two-part series, uh, and we're excited to have the Sydney group be giving their experience how to use DEM uh, in their teaching. Uh, you can see that lecture three, lecture four, lecture five continues that spirit. Uh, looking at DEM for a deeper understanding and then using for open source code and then looking at visualization and that sort of thing. So, so um, that is the uh, current plan that we have for the next three months or so. So please join the other uh, lectures as well. Um, I'm going to stop my video and then uh, my presentation. And then uh, I will next pa pass to uh, Benji. Uh, Benji, thank you very much for agreeing to give this particular presentation. Uh, we're very excited. And for the audience participants, if you have any questions, please put it in the chat, and then we can discuss about your questions during the chat, uh, Q and A session at the end of this uh, sort of a lecture series lecture. So, Benji, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kenichi, um, and thanks for the opportunity to give this presentation. Uh, uh, to, to be honest, um, I, I am a geotechnical engineer, but I have not ever taught any geotechnical engineering classes. Um, I've, I've been teaching all kinds of other things, uh, but working together with Francois and Itai, who are both here today, uh, we've been putting together some resources for um, uh, doing virtual teaching um, to try to understand soil mechanics. And a lot of them using DEM, and then we're trying to use DEM as well as a uh, leverage to be able to do um, a more upscale, larger things um, on top of that. So um, just to get started, I've got a link here, um, which I, um, I might just pop into the chat. But everything that we're going to do today um, is on this website. So I might just open the link up. And that'll take us, hopefully that loads. Um, so this is a page we put together um or primarily for this uh for this presentation and the presentation francois gave a couple of weeks ago um but the the idea here is that uh, all of the resources that we go through today together they're pretty much all here so there's a bunch of resources and then where reference material or lesson plans or worksheets or assessments exist um they're, they're here as well so anything that you see today please um feel free you can use everything um it's all ready to go so uh, we'll come back to this uh, again in a bit. All right. So I just wanted to start off a bit with um, why we teach laboratory classes. Um, in geotechnical engineering, I think it's pretty clear that we should be teaching uh, with labs. We really want people to understand uh, what's going on with soil. And if they don't uh, touch or see any soil, that's a, a huge missed opportunity there. Um, but there's really a lot of different goals that people identify when they talk about laboratory teaching. Um, one might be that you really get a deeper understanding of the concepts that are otherwise um, can be quite theoretical. Um, you get to apply these concepts to new situations as well. You get to, when things don't go well, you get to um, exercise your critical thinking to try to improve uh, 
your, your results and, and try to understand how to, how to get better results next time. You also get some specific training and equipment. So if it's really important that our graduates know how to use the triaxial, then they get trained in that triaxial through the use of a laboratory session. They get a better understanding of errors. Um, often they'll be put into teams. So they get, get some understanding of teamwork, report writing, and hypothesis testing. So th these are really all the good things um, that you get from a real physical laboratory. So the question then is what really is the point of a virtual laboratory? Um, so a lot of those things we're, we're not gonna be able to do, um, but on the upside, uh, we can completely remove all of the constraints of reality. Um, so we can do things that are too fast or too slow to be done in, in real space, um, too big or too small. We can see things that the human eye can't see. Uh, we can do things that are horrendously unsafe um, and Sometimes these things scale really well. You, you build them once um, and then it's free to deploy them to all of your students. Um, unlike a normal lab where we, we need to be um, setting up the experiment for every single student. So these are kind of the benefits of a virtual lab. The downside is that immediately we lose authenticity. So the, this is not real soil anymore. This is some simulation of soil on the computer. Um, in that respect, it's immediately less practical, less relevant to students. Um, somehow we've shifted our goal away from trying to teach people about soil. Now we're trying to teach people about some kind of simulation of soil. Um, and, and often it's very hard to do teamwork um, in these kinds of situations. So um, in my opinion, the, these labs that we're going to talk about today, um, they would be a fantastic augmentation to physical labs. I don't want to at all imply that we should be replacing physical labs. I think that the, the kinds of things that I'm gonna to try to present now will really go hand in hand with, with traditional physical labs um, and try to give additional insight to what's going on inside those labs. So we've got about 45 minutes left and we're gonna to try to get through two different um, sets of classes. Uh, the first one is trying to understand what's happening inside a representative volume element. Um, and then in the second lab, we're going to go all the way through, starting off with at the micro scale and then up at the macro scale. Um, and depending on your teaching, it may or may not be so relevant to you. So, um, so ju just to recap some of the things that Francois talked about last time, uh, when it comes to teaching people you, by using the DEM to um, help them understand, we kind of, in, in our minds, arrange things on these two axes of depth of learning and ease of use. So if you get someone to write their own code from start to finish, they're gonna learn a lot, but it's very difficult and time consuming. The next step down would be to run some existing code. So if you pull um, lights or Yade or Mercury off the internet, you compile that and you run it, you're gonna learn a lot, um, but it's gonna, it's gonna take you quite, amount of, quite an amount of effort. Down in the bottom right, um, you could be just taking a pre-compiled lesson that's ready to go um, and the easiest possible way is it's just a website you go to, you don't need to install anything and everything's just gonna run directly for you in the browser. And so today I'm pretty much exclusively gonna talk about that thing in the bottom right is where we're just gonna run exercises in the browser. So if you're thinking about deploying these things in your teaching, all you need to do is point your students towards a URL. They work best in Chrome. Um, so as long as a student has a computer made in the last five years or a phone made in the last five years and, and Chrome installed on it, they should be able to do all of these exercises with no installation. Um, and so I really think that in my mind, at least these things are really targeted at the undergraduate experience, but we really want them to understand the concepts, but they don't need to get so deep into the philosophy or coding behind um, any of these things. Really the focus here is on the soil mechanics and not so much on how the discrete element behaves. So let's start off with, um, with lesson one, which is uh, all about the mechanical behavior of a representative volume element. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm imagining this is some uh, course that you're gonna teach and it's gonna be composed of a few weeks. And in week one, we'll do lab one. Um, and the kinds of things we might wanna teach in lab one would be um, for a soil, we know that it's got density and rate dependent stiffness. And we, we might wanna impart that in, in, uh, on a student. And the vehicle we're gonna to use to do that is odometric compression. So we have, this is the page that the students go to. Um, on the right-hand side is the DEM simulation. And then on the left-hand side, it's actually also the DEM simulation. It's we take all the grains, we take all the forces between them um, and we do a calculation for what's the overall 
vertical stress over all of these grains. So th this isn't actually, we're not measuring any forces on walls here. We're measuring inside the grains, what's the typical vertical stress. Um, and in the top right are the controls. Um, so we, we can turn our loading on by clicking that loading active button. We're gonna have a loading rate where that top button is gonna come down and start squishing the grains. Um, at the moment, the grains aren't colored by anything in particular. Um, we could color them by velocity or rotation rate. Um, there's no gravity um, and we're, we're ready to go. So all the student has to do is click this loading active button and that top platen starts to come down and we can see the live data um, coming out on the left. If the student wants to stop the loading, they untick the loading active button um, and everything is paused. Uh, if they want to download this data in the top left, they just click the download button and they get a CSV file, which they can open up in Excel. And that CSV file contains the vertical stress and the vertical displacement over time. So really this is all it takes for a student to now be interrogating what's happening in this kind of odometric compression test. Um, they can do all kinds of things. We can do cycles of loading. So if you just leave this loading active button going, this um, platen is gonna come down a fair way and then it's gonna go back up and then come down again. Um, in this simple example, I've got it set up that really the only variable they can change is the loading rate. So if they wanted to increase the rate and make this thing go faster, they could. Um, and we're gonna start getting cycles of loading here. So th there's lots of kinds of questions you can ask um, or the student can ask of what's going on in this, in this situation. Um, and we'll, we'll get into those in a second. So I have a, a sample lesson plan for what you might do with this kind of tool. Um, so in my mind, it would help to start off with a bit of an introduction, you know, give them a recap of forces between particles, how that leads to stresses. Um, they could watch you do a demo of the simulation. Then you could get the students to start loading the material for one cycle, export the data as a CSV, and then you could get them to convert that to maybe e log p space in Excel. Um, and then once we have this, we can start talking about the stiffness of the material. And you, you can see that this, this line wasn't a straight line. So that means that the stiffness of the material is changing as it's being loaded. It's one of the, one of the important um, characteristics of granular media. And something you could do if you wanted to, you get them to perform many cycles of compression and look how the stiffness of the material is changing as we, we continue doing cycles. So th this is how, how what one way you could um, put a 60 minute lesson plan um, around this kind of example. So once students have some kind of understanding about the compressive behavior of these materials, um, we can start talking a little bit about failure. Um, and one way to do that is um, by discussing friction angle and when things and how things fail. Um, so in this example, it's the same idea, but here there's just particles um, raining down onto a flat plate. Um, it's quite a big simulation, about a thousand particles, well, one or two thousand particles. Um, and here, all the students can do is they can tilt the plate. So on the left, there's a few noisy graphs. Uh, the black line is the velocity field. At the moment, it's all just hovering around zero. Um, and then there's two blue lines, one for the pressure, one for the shear stress. Um, and the students with the keyboard or with the mouse, they can start tilting this system. Um, so we're at about 18 degrees now. You can see this is kind of starting to flow. Um, you can see that we've developed a velocity field inside. We have some not so steady um, pressure and shear stress fields, but they, they kind of stabilize over time as this thing starts to flow. And the students can now start interrogating, um, what, what does it mean when we rotate this plate? What, what does failure look like? Um, and at, at what angle, or to really reinforce this concept that there's some kind of angle at which this material will start to flow. Um, so they, they can look at the angle directly. They can also look at the ratio of the, the shear stress and the pressure to, to try to get some comparison there. And the same thing here in the top left, they can click the download button and they can download a snapshot um, of the um, velocity field, pressure field and the shear stress. Right. So uh, once we have that, we could run through a third lab um, and in this third lab, we could start going a little bit deeper. We could start talking about the critical state behavior. Um, if we wanted to, we could talk about the mu of I rheology, if that was important in your teaching. Um, or we, we could um, start to explain really what is this friction that we're talking about. And so here we have uh, yet another simulation, same idea, but now this is what's called a Lee Edwards box. So it's a, it's a box that's periodic in every direction um, and we're shearing infinitely. So we can, we can have a look around and the, there's particles popping in and out of all the surfaces. 
Um, so now when we're looking at the front, the particles at the top are going to the right and at the bottom are going to the left and we're shearing this system. Um, and you can see the resultant velocity field on the left-hand side um, and also the pressure and shear stress fields inside. And you could imagine that we could ask these students to download the pressure and the shear stress um, for a few different shear rates and they, they could understand how this ratio of um, shear stress to pressure um, is developing as we uh, change the applied rate. Um, so th th this tool, uh, even though it's relatively straightforward, would, would be a, quite an insight for, for people who um, don't know much about soils. And uh, with these kinds of tools, they really don't need any background in how the DEM works. It's reasonably straightforward that you can see the particles on one side and we can see the what we call the coarse grain fields or the, the average properties on the left-hand side. So that's, uh, that's kind of it for that first uh, lesson. So the, we've kind of broke it down into a few different material properties that we could target for each one of them. We have a specific simulation and then we can construct a small lesson plan um, around there. And so to, just, to, just to clarify, so if we go back to the, the website with all of the um, examples, we, we've gone through the um, odometric compression example. If you click on this link here, uh, that will take you directly to the example. Um, I'll just copy paste in the link here for anyone who's joined recently. Um, so that there's a link here to education.sigem.com. That's this website. Um, and we've been through the um, odometric compression, the inclined plane flow, and then the Lee's Edwards shear examples. And for some of these, we have some reference materials, lessons, plans, worksheets um, for you to use if you so choose. All right. So that's kind of it for the, the first lesson. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about other things we can do with the same kinds of tools. So we're, we're very lucky here that we have uh, a virtual reality lab where we can do teaching in this kind of space. Um, and there's been quite a few studies recently on the impact of augmented or virtual reality on teaching and how much students learn. Um, and that there's been a reasonable amount of evidence showing that there is a measurable and positive impact on students learning. Um, they find it interesting, they find it motivational, um, and that it's something that they will genuinely remember. Uh, so there, there's a, a link here, but there, there's many other um, works on this topic. Um, but what we can do is we can try to deploy these kinds of tools um, into virtual reality. So this is the lab we have here in Sydney. We've got about 26 uh, virtual reality headsets, each one connected to a computer. Um, and you, you can see here students all wearing the face masks uh, with the hand controls and they're, they're playing around um, in virtual reality. Um, so that's just, just another shot of the room. So uh, each computer's um, got, it's got about a one by one square meter space in front of it where a student can explore. Once they put those headsets on, um, they can't see their hands anymore. So they're all flailing around doing things and um, need to get a bit of space so that they're not hitting each other too often. Um, so yeah, so th th this is the layout, layout of our space. Um, it's uh, scaled quite similarly to a computer lab. It's a little bit less dense, um, but otherwise the requirements are, are quite similar. Um, one of the main differences here is that you have to take the wheels off the chairs um, to be able to run a VR lab so that people aren't rolling around when they don't know where they are. So um, we've run quite a lot of students through our laboratory here. Uh, we started off in 2017 with about 500 students to use the lab in one semester. Um, and then uh, at the end of 2018, it was more like uh, 1,200 students. Uh, we, we unfortunately had to close for a while um, due to COVID, but we're, we're about to reopen. Um, we, we've done quite a lot of surveying on students. Um, and back at that time, many had not used VR before. But uh, most of them, uh, upwards of 70, 80% felt like they um, had an, they, the, they self reported that they had an increased um, feeling that they'd learned something during that time. Um, and almost all of them felt that they would like to use uh, VR in their teaching again at some stage. Um, so we, we've used, we've had almost 5,000 students um, through our lab so far, mo not, most of them not um, studying geotechnical engineering. Uh, but about 70% of them self-reported that they um, had some kind of enhanced learning outcome from this kind of experience. Um, and we've estimated that our cost per visit is around $20 to have a student in the lab. So that, that includes uh, setting up the space, technician time, the actual equipment, um, it, having a you know, five-year lifespan. 
Um, but you, you do get quite a lot of turnover. So it, it wasn't prohibitively expensive for us to set this up. And I, I strongly recommend if anyone wants to go there, um, they definitely should. I've got a photo here of Francois who gave the presentation at the last event. This is uh, where we were set up at the DEM8 conference. Um, and there's another academic, Stefan Luding here, who's um, flying through VR in a DEM simulation. Um, if anyone's interested, we, uh, we can send you the link if you have a VR headset. Um, so all, all the examples that we've shown before, it's possible to, um, to implement them into VR um, so that you can then, instead of applying the loads with a mouse and a keyboard, you can actually start trying to squeeze on the grains um, to see how they behave. It's a very immersive environment where you really get to go in between the grains um, and you get a, a very different feeling for what's going on um, inside these DEM simulations. Okay, so that's that's it for lesson one where we were talking about um, representative volume elements and how they uh, behave. Uh, so lesson two I wanted to go through is all about landslides. Um, and we're gonna start off really at the micro scale and we're gonna talk about how the how we measure and understand the material properties of landslides. And then we're gonna go through all the way through to trying to model full scale landslides um, in, in a teaching environment. So the first lab I'd like to propose would be one where we're trying to teach students about failure. Uh, and that, that failure is really in the context of critical state soil mechanics. Um, and the vehicle we use to do that is a simulation of a triaxial test. Um, now, I, I think I, I made the disclaimer at the beginning that I'm not much of a geotechnical engineer myself. So in my mind, um, it's perfectly okay to have a, a cube as our um, experimental domain. I understand most people are normally familiar with a, a cylinder for a triaxial test. Um, it's it's a, a work in progress for us. Um, but so far, we, we, we have here a, a cuboidal specimen full of grains. Um, and on the left, we have, uh, we have our uh, Q, P, rho space. So the deviatoric stress, the pressure, and the density. Um, and uh, let me just clear the line. Um, and as our sample moves around, we're going to start developing a line here. So what we can do is, uh, so it's currently set up that we're going to be consolidating up to one KPA. So we can start performing this consolidation um, and you can see straight away, the density starts to increase, the pressure starts to increase as the box on the right gets smaller and smaller. Um, and eventually we're at a pressure of about 500 pascals um, as it's consolidating. Eventually we get to a pressure of about a thousand where it stabilizes. Um, and now we can start performing our shear. We, we've set it up with a axial loading rate of about, uh, is this 0 0.001 millimeters per second, it's quite a, quite a slow rate. Um, and we're gonna start shearing. And as we're shearing, you can see we're starting coming essentially vertically upwards as we're applying more and more deviatoric stress. Um, it's still going up and up. Um, and that this is happening on the right, we can see that we've got these um, the, the loads being applied vertically. And then we, we hit some peak value and then we, we have some kind of failure event. Now we couldn't see much there, but luckily because this is a DEM simulation, we can look at, we don't need to just be looking at the particles. We can be looking at them when we color them by their velocity or color them by how fast they're rotating. Um, and what we can do is we can, um, we can go back, we can um, click new loading path. We're gonna reset the particles back to their initial condition. We'll get a new line loading up here. We can set a higher consolidation pressure, perform a new consolidation. I mean, you can see now we have an, an orange line developing where again, we're compressing the particles. Um, so we got the density increasing. We also have the pressure increasing. Um, we're gonna get up to about 6,000 pascals this time. Um, and once we're there, about now we can start performing our shearing. And once we perform the shearing again, uh, we can see as that top, top and bottom platen move towards each other. Um, oh, so not much going on in the rotation rate just yet. All the particles are essentially station, uh, essentially moving as a, a box. It's, nothing is rotating. Uh, but we're, we're growing and growing in deviatoric stress. Hopefully, eventually, this sample will fail. Let me just increase the loading rate a little bit. 
And you can see here, okay, we're still loading up. So I went to quite a high um, confining stress. It's taking a while to fail. I believe we should be there any second. You can see now there's particles starting to rotate near the boundaries, we've got some area here that's starting to fail. And you can see we've reached some kind of peak stress here and, and things now not behaving nicely. And we're, we're definitely failing this material. So th this is quite a nice way to understand what we mean by failure. Um, it's also really nice in that we can um, do lots of um, consolidation, that we, we can consolidate to many different consolidation pressures, and then we can start cheering. And we, we can really build up a failure locus um, ma manually by hand here. We can do the same thing. We can export this into Excel and we can start asking students to do some kind of analysis of, of what is failure, um, when is it happening from this, from this data. So that, that's the, um, the triaxial simulator. Um, the, we have a little lesson plan here. So the, the way I would structure this is that, you know, we'd start off with a little introduction, again, give them a recap of forces, stresses, and then in this particular instance, we need to start talking about invariance, the, um, the pressure P, and then we need to, um, it, Introduce also the debitoric stress Q. Um, you could show them a demonstration of how it works. Um, and then I'd get the students to do a parametric study where you consolidate to different pressures um, and then load to failure and record P, Q, and row at point of failure. And then start to um, get the students to try to understand what does that mean. So that, that might be uh, why they might have different values if they've loaded at different rates. Um, it also might be what does what. What, what does the failure locus, locus look like? They could start plotting that in Excel. Um, and you could have a quite a nice discussion here about the context of critical state soil mechanics with, um, and how it's relevant to these kinds of simulations. Okay. So that's the, that's the first lab where we start off at the micro scale. And once we have these ideas of failure and uh, friction angles, um, we can start talking about slope stability. So we're, we're moving up in scales to larger and larger scales now. So uh, we've taken the DEM, we've got the data out of that, we've fitted some lines to it, we've interpreted it through the lens of critical state soil mechanics. And we can then take that information, you can teach them the regular thing we teach about slope stability, and we can try to apply that at a larger scale. So this is another online tool we have. This is not, not a DEM based one, uh, but this here is really implementing the slope stability that we would normally teach in class. Uh, so what we have in the top right here is that this is just an overlay of OpenStreetMap. This is a region just south of Sydney near Wollongong, which has some nice big cliffs and you can see quite a rapid topographic change. Um, we're gonna analyze this with a infinite slope stability module, uh, model, sorry. We, we define our specific weight, cohesion, friction angle, uh, rock depth and water table depth. Um, if you click on the map, we can move these points around. Uh, when we move these points around, uh, it's just loading at the moment, but uh, we call from a server and we get the, um, from an elevation map, we can pull out the um, elevation profile along there. Once we have the elevation profile, we can do a calculation of the factor of safety. So we've implemented this here for the infinite slope model, um, Kuhlman's model and Taylor's charts. Um, and you can see we get, we get a different factor of safety depending on uh, which one of these we do. Uh, but on top of that, so not, not only can we um, move our points around and we can pick any two areas to define as our failure plane um, and try to calculate the factor of safety there. Uh, we can also click down here where it says overlay and we can have a look at the factor of safety everywhere. Um, so we, we've implemented, uh, when I say we, I mean Francois. Francois has implemented uh, a solver here where it tries to um, define locally everywhere what's the, the nearest slope. Um, which direction does it go? Um, and, then, and then locally everywhere in space, we, we get a measure of the factor of safety. Um, and so you, you can see we, we have overlaid on top of the, um, on top of the regular map, um, this notion of the um, factor of safety everywhere. And if we were to change the friction angle, make that a bit lower, you'd see it would start to fail. And of course, if we increase the friction angle, everything would be nice and safe. And this is a really great tool because you can start to ask students questions about real situations. So they, you can get them to look at a whole mountain range and try to find the worst case scenario. You can get them to look at um, historical records 
and try to interpret why did a particular landslide happen um, you, and all, all kinds of things in, in that kind of vein. So th th this again, this is just another website that you can um, send your students to if you so choose. So it's down on the education.sidegem.com page. It is down at the slope stability module. It's this one here. And it comes with an example assignment that Francois uses with his students. All right, so the, the idea here is that we've, we've used the DEM to set up well, what, what's the friction angle? How does that relate to the soil properties? How does that relate to individual grains? And then we, we've scaled up from there all the way up to the field scale. Um, so a lesson plan here, something you might want to do is you could give them a recap of the stability stuff that you've already taught them in class. Um, you could give, uh, if you wanted to, locations and soil parameters of real landslides and ask them to look at the factor of safety for those locations. And then if you wanted to, you get them to start playing around with the material parameters um, and try to understand what might have caused this thing to fail. And there are all, all kinds of um, educational things you could do there. Okay, so that's the, the lesson on landslides. That's the, the online version. And the, the online version, uh, unfortunately for us, um, came second. We, uh, we started off with a real version that we couldn't do during COVID. Um, the real version, uh, so we, it's the, the, the same idea as that lab we just did, but we'll, we'll come back to it again. We're, again, we're looking at slope stability, but we really wanted originally uh, for students to be able to interact more meaningfully with the terrain and to be able to alter the terrain and see how that affects um, the factor of safety as well, as well as a bunch of other things. So I've got a little computer rendering of what we're about to show you. So this is what we call, uh, this is an augmented reality sandbox. It's not something we invented. There's plans for this off the internet, but we have added a lot of extra features. So you've got some sand in a box um, and we, there is a um, projector and a camera mounted up above them. And we can, uh, we, 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 with the, so it's not a camera, a depth sensor. Um, with the depth sensor, we can measure the depth everywhere and then we can project whatever colors we want back onto the slope. Um, and once we do that, uh, we, we can start using it for our teaching. This is one of our classes here. And you can see the colored sand at the bottom. Um, and I'll pass over now, I think, to Francois, who's going to show us. Oh, I'll, I'll, let, let me um, spin this around. Hopefully, hopefully you can see. Okay. Um, sorry, I can't actually tell if anyone can see anything. All right, great. So this is Francois over here. Um, so Francois is in front of the sandbox that's set up in my office. Let me just turn the lights off. It works really nicely in the dark. Um, and so we, we've got the depth sensor up the top and a projector. Um, there's a touch screen here for the students to use. Um, and you can see Francois playing with the sand. Um, maybe I'll bring it a bit closer. That's the whole point of the laptop. Um, so uh, as Francois plays with the sand, you can see that the at the moment we're just drawing colors directly over the sand. So the deeper it is, if it's underwater, that's blue. Um, the higher areas are red um, and students can uh, build whatever they want, uh, but they can also be directed to build specific things. So, Francois, if you could just put us into build mode. Uh, so now you can see there's a little uh, Google Maps um, thing here and the students can on Google Maps find the region that they want to build. Uh, so if this was it, if they click enable build mode, it will guide them to build that place that they just saw on Google Maps. Um, and so here, blue means that the terrain is too high. Red means that it's too low. Um, and if you get it all white, that means that you've rebuilt the terrain that you were looking at on Google Maps. It does take some time. Uh, so we, we may not uh, reconstruct it all, but you can see it hopefully getting whiter and whiter over time. Um, and then once you've got the terrain as you want it, what do you think? Is this good enough? It would be good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so once you've got the terrain as you want it, we can get back out of this module and go into the slope stability module. And we, we have quite a similar interface to what we had online where you can set the uh, material properties um, and then we can see live on the sand the, the, the factor of safety everywhere. So if we, Francois is fiddling with the specific weight of the material, yeah, might be a quick update. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, takes a little while to compute. And you can see here we've got right on the steep area, we've got quite a low factor of safety. So any, anything red is, is under one. Um, and then as we start to increase the friction angle, click the update button. 
uh, that should get safer and safer. Uh, so the idea here is we can really give students um, real terrain, um, get them to build it, and then ask them to alter the terrain uh, to make it safe. Um, so that, that uh, we're really um, bringing it back to what they've learned about slope stability. Cool. Thank you, Francois. Thank you. All right, let me set this back up and turn the lights back on. Okay. Uh, um, so that's, oh, uh, I've been talking way too fast, um, but I'll, I'll just um, summarize with a, a, it'll probably take me five minutes to, to wrap things up. But um, I, I just wanted to talk a bit about virtual labs. So the, the labs we've been talking about here, they've all been designed to be as easy to implement as, as it is possible for us to do so. Um, we've tried to make everything just a single website that you can point your students to. Um, and we, we really hope that you take the time and opportunity to, to try out some of these with your students or on your own or something. Um, and I just wanted to make a strong point here that uh, not in any way um, saying that you should stop running tracks or tests and just have students do a DEM test, that would be missing the point. I think these are a good addition to some real labs. So these are places where, um, where I, I didn't show, but you can see the stresses inside the, or stresses, um, the forces between the particles uh, and how that relates to the, the stress field. Um, we can see inside the, um, the body, you can zoom in and do fly throughs. Um, but the real downside here is that obviously this is a bunch of spheres in a box. It's not exactly what we would consider authentic um, in a geotechnical laboratory. Um, but we can really see some scales and quantities that um, otherwise it's very difficult to see um, with an experiment. And, and lastly, just with the, the nature of the technical committee, I just thought it was really nice that we can try to make this connection all the way starting at the micro scale, work our way through the um, constitutive scale and then up into the macro scale. Um, so where to from here? Uh, these labs uh, have been used extremely lightly by our students. They're, they're all essentially brand new. I've uh, been working on them as recently as an hour ago. Um, and we would love if you tried them out and sent us some feedback. Uh, we would also love some feature requests. If, if these things don't do exactly what you have in mind or they don't work properly, please let us know. Um, we're very keen to, to make these work for you in your teaching. Um, so uh, definitely give that a go. Um, you can do that by going to this website here, uh, education.sigem.com. If you go there, there's a contact us page in the top right, um, where it's got a link to how to email us or post any comments uh, you might have. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess that's all from me. Um, sorry for running quite a bit under time. Uh, but yeah, if anyone um, has any questions or anything, uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Benji. Very nice. Starting from DM to augmented reality and physical experiments. There are so many things that you showed. Uh, very, very nice. I think we should uh, invite some questions. Um, anybody to start with? Um, maybe any comments from Itai, from the Sydney group first? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure here. I can't use this microphone. Oh, mic. oh okay. Right. Uh, any question? Maybe Dayu? I think there's a question in the chat box. Oh, now I can speak, by the way. Oh, there you go. Itai, I go just, I, maybe I, instead of a question, I said that there is actually one, one, one question. I think that, yeah, it, <laughs> that was, I wanted to say the same yeah. thing. So, Benji, there is a question there by Alessandro. Sure. From Bari. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the question we, is that how do you define stresses in DEM? There was a little bit of discussion. There was a discussion about that in Francois' um, presentation, member. Benji, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so we, we use the exact tool that Francois showed in his presentation. So we take um, all of the particles, all of the forces between them, um, and we do some kind of spatial average uh, to define the stresses. So um, in some of the examples, we were just showing one value for the whole system. So that's, we take all the particle and we take a spatial average of all the forces in all the directions. Um, and we end up with, with a single number for the whole sample. 
Um, in the other ones where we, we have them varying in space, uh, we actually uh, use a process called coarse graining where we, um, I, I, maybe I can give a reference to the paper, but the, it's a, essentially we, um, we, we do a spatial average, but in, in a small localized um, region to get the values at each point. Yes, so maybe you can, uh, uh, yeah, was it uh, Alexander? Can watch the um, video that uh, Francois made in the lecture one. Uh, I see uh, Professor Maria Pantazo, who is um, who is the chair of the TC three hundred five. I forgot which one was. Uh, Marina, do you want to ask directly if you can unmute yourself? I'm sorry, I don't know. Can you hear me well? <laughs> Marina, do you want to ask a question? Uh, is, the, is the sound okay? Yeah, absolutely okay. Okay. My question was in, uh, and the, the technical committee is three or six, so please uh, visit us. Um, but I had this question about the second example. What was holding the sample in place? Uh, it was tilting. What was happening at the boundaries? I lost completely the physical Sorry. equivalent of that. Sorry, yeah, uh, you're, you're right. I, I didn't explain that at all. Um, so did, I think this is the example. So we, there's a physical wall at the base of the experiment, but then in the left, right, and front back directions, there's periodic boundaries. So any particle that leaves out of the right comes back in at the left. Um, so if I rotate a bit, we'll see. So it's just the one set of particles and every time they leave the domain, they come back inside. Um, so we're, we're kind of assuming that this is an infinitely long slope with this same set of grains kind of repeated again and again all the way down the slope. I don't, I don't know if you can see them leaving and then coming back in. Maybe the frame rate isn't good enough. But they, okay. they do look like they magically disappear. Oh, sorry? I understood what you meant by leaving and coming back. So that helps a lot. Thank you. Yes. It's a little bit more fluid mechanics problem, but then it's going to granular mechanics problem. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But that's something people can start linking with soul mechanics and granular mechanics and fluid mechanics, I guess. Uh, we have another question from Chung Song Chu. Uh, the interactive kit at the end was really cool. I agree as well. Just to link it closer to geotechnical engineering, is it possible to map the slope gradients rather than the elevation? If so, it could be tied to the tilt of the DM simulations, creating more synergy between DM and interactive kit. That was a suggestion, but any thoughts from that, Benji? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, as part of the calculation to get to the factor of safety, we do need to calculate the, the slope everywhere. So we, that, I didn't, we didn't show, but it, it is one of the things you can show as a field is the, the gradient everywhere. Um, to have the gradient being used to have some DEM particles run down the slope is something we've talked about, but not something we've implemented. I can see Francois uh, getting up to do a little demonstration. Um, but the, so the, so the, this is the idea here. So that if you, you, you can show, change what you want to display. So one of them would be the slope angle or, um, so the, the, this is now the slope angle, uh, which, which is the, the steepness. Um, yeah, so yellow is uh, steeper. <laughs> this is pretty flat. And you have also the direction, so. Um, so together it's the whole yeah, so. <laughs> together it's the whole slope gradient effectively. So yeah, you could yeah. use that. Um, this is very noisy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the definitely we, we have access to the slope everywhere to simulate particles rolling down the hill in some kind of landslide is something we have discussed uh, quite a lot. Uh, we have never implemented that because of the complexity involved. Um, so we. Uh, a lot of this stuff we, we wrote ourselves, but some of it was written um, by others. Something that was written by someone else is um, a fluid simulator. So in this one, you can hold your hand up and it rains under your hand, and then you get water flowing down the slopes. Um, and so th this is actually using a depth average simulation for the fluid flow. Um, it's something, if you just change the viscosity a bit, it could be a depth average flow of um, a granular material, uh, which we absolutely have not implemented in any way. 
Um, but to have actual particles rolling down um, is something we, in principle, could do. Um, in practice, <laughs> um, I don't think <laughs> yeah, we, we have not done. But yeah, that, it would be a very cool idea. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. And there's additional saying, very cool, like your own mini live slope map, risk map. So let's add water and simulate debris flows. So perfect, perfect. There's <laughs> another, yeah, yeah, request, Benji. <laughs> and uh, actually, I've seen a similar, uh, uh, exactly similar one with the water. I haven't seen the slope, so this was great to see. And then I saw some people using for the wildfire. So they mm -hmm. see this, and then they show the fire propagation using this technique as well. So you can make your own terrain and then you see how the fire is propagating. And this is in California. So, so you can start to use this sort of sandpit in a different ways and uh, in a different uh, disciplines. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have to ask my colleague, uh, Joel. Yeah, I, I had a quick question about um, in visualizing like the PQ space, um, do you find that maybe that's like challenging for students with some of the noise associated with DEM or like, do you maybe help them average it? So like when they see it for the first time, it's kind of a nicer curve or do you have any thoughts on that? So the data, we it, everything today was totally unfiltered yeah. uh, um, <laughs> because you guys uh, are all academics. Definitely, um, uh, it is definitely possible. And I would imagine we would all typically start smoothing things, especially over time. To, to make these fields a bit more a bit more stationary for students, um, yeah, yeah de definitely. Um, so I, this has all been running on my laptop um, while I'm running Zoom. So I, we kept the particle numbers quite small. Um, the other solution is to do bigger simulations, uh, but then they uh, obviously running DM simulations in real time that you're never going to have hundreds of thousands of particles. Um, that's the, the nature of the problem. We have a, I can do about a thousand particles on my phone in real time, if that's. Yes. That's in your web page. Yeah. Web page version. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Dennis Heinrich. Thank you for that very interesting presentation. I couldn't even imagine using augmented reality in a way you did here, especially in teaching environment. Keep up the, keep up the good work. Yeah, that's a really one. Augmented reality, I think it's interesting and you show that how students got excited what part of they got excited in the sort of a going through the particles or what what is the excitement that if you can give some example that would be great um yeah with the virtual reality headset uh it's um much more because the well depending on the scale that you set the particles at, they can be quite large when you're you know a similar scale to them um, it can be quite confronting have them flow around you we, we have one example where you're a particle and the flow is going around you, um, which is quite disorienting. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if we found a fantastic use case for virtual reality in where you, where you genuinely learn more than if you're just doing it with a mouse and a keyboard, but where we will continue trying until we find one, um, I think. Uh, right. But just, just the, the ability to really be in there and Normally, when you try to interrogate 3D information, you can kind of see it from the outside, or you can take a slice through it, or there's a lot of clunky ways to be able to see it. But just to be able to walk through inside the volume, mm. um, you get, get quite a different perspective on what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Would it keep reinvent the way of how void ratio is thinking about, or how the <laughs> void is, and what does void means, or tortuosity and that sort of concept, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there are a variety of sort of a conceptual ideas that we have, and then we use like tortuosity as a sort of parameter to look at fluid flow through the material, porous material, but then, yeah, this may be used as a tool to see that, or how fluid flows around the pores, because you can do fluid mechanics and see how the fluid velocity changes depending on where you are. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, any other questions from our colleagues? Now, these are all for undergraduate students. Or do, do you use it for graduate student as well? Or you use these as for graduate students as well? Uh, so I, I don't personally teach any geotechnical engineering. This is just something I do with, uh, with Francois as a side hobby. This is um, spawned out of a recent work that we did where we needed to write our own DEM code. 
Um, and then now, now we have one. So it's the <laughs> we, we were trying to make good use right, of it. Right, right, right. But it will be used. It, it will be used this year, Kenichi. David Riley oh. here. My, yeah. Oh, <laughs> we, okay. will, we will make use of it. I can report yeah. how it went. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so the, the GTM examples only work reasonably well as of today. So they're, they're largely untested. Yeah, <laughs> great for me. Yeah. Itai, you may want to explain about your background. I think it's rice crisp speed, right? Yeah, but you should have asked everyone to guess what it is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because I think that, uh, yeah, today I asked my student what, it, what is it, and I got all sorts of fun. Answers. No one actually got to Rice Krispie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, keep... it's it's actually it's actually a a, a, a microscope uh, image taken by Francois. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been but, given the talk. Yeah. Mm, but again, the virtual reality may help also as walk around the Rice Krispie yeah. as well. Yeah. I I'm, I think those are close close cells, so it's unlike a sand. <laughs> You'll have to hit the walls from time to time. Do you have any idea of virtual reality in a little bit more landslide and more go to the landslide or an experienced landslide or something like that? A yes, bit VR more. for yeah. site inspections is fantastic. So um, it's relatively cheap and easy these days to, you can either with your phone, just move around and take a 360 degree photo or for a couple of hundred dollars, you can buy a, Thing where you click once and it takes a full snapshot and then the well once you get home you you don't have to rely on having taken a photo of the right angle you can you can see everything um so that, that that's reasonably straightforward these days um I, i've seen quite a lot of people using that for site inspections right what, what is your next step for the dm um development uh, now you have this one. Are you thinking about different share modes or what are the concepts that you like to teach using this DM tool? Um, uh, I'm mostly responding to requests from others. Uh, <laughs> um, so the, de definitely, please, if anyone has something um, in mind, please send us an email. Um, yeah, I, I don't have any fixed plans for, for what next. I see, I see. Francois or Itai? Anything from your side? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I agree with the uh, with the issues of the noisy data. But you know, it, you could of the small samples, uh, you you have to explain to the student why it happens. But then I think it's nice to let them do the experiments and and read read those CSV files. And uh, I do I do a course now that that I, I would probably incorporate it, um, which is more along the line of constitutive modeling for postgraduate um, levels. And, you know, you, you could let them experiments produce from this virtual sand experiments and then given different constitutive models. So this is going to constitutive modeling, which is something that we haven't mentioned. Uh, you know, if you have elastic models, try to if it's linear elasticity or non-linear elasticity or whatever elasticity you want, you have a model, but this is now your virtual reality and you need to sort of interpret the parameter of your macroscopic constitutive model. So that, that's the way I was, I was thinking about that. And um, yeah, so, so it's, it's sort of like use the virtual reality as a way of engaging and getting the parameters of your model and understand the different complexity of constitutive models with this, and then maybe make another simulations, which is entirely different and see how bad the model is. And I can guarantee that most of them will be, if not all, really bad. So that, that's just appreciations of the limits of constitutive models that come to replace SEND. Um, and, and that's one way I'm thinking that, that I might be using it. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think Marina has another question. Marina, do you want to say? It's just a comment. Yeah. It was related to how we can use that. I'm much more, um, I have a very small ambitions 
Uh, I would like to be able in the first class of soil mechanics to show them how to go from particle to particle force to stress. That was our first question. So I have, I, I guess I have to revisit the first uh, seminar I, I missed and then to revisit the concept in uh, one dimensional compression. I would like that very much and I, I would try to do it. Yeah, thanks Maria. Benji, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, I don't. Yeah, well, maybe I can talk oh, about sorry, yeah, just yeah. a little bit. I mean, that's something that I think I, I kind of uh, use in the in the particle mechanics course that, that I'm, I teach. I mean, it's just an hour, but usually what I do is I I, I do show um, basically the result of a discrete element simulation that just shows a particle and then um, removes a particle and just shows a force chain, and then uh, basically by by simply introducing the student to, the, to this idea of course graining, so just to this idea of um, uh, spatial averaging, basically, uh, uh, go there, like bring them all the way to having a continuous representation, basically, of the stress from, mm -hmm. um, from these discrete forces and their, and their uh, spatial average. Um, so that's something um, that, yes, I, I, I do in, uh, you know, not, not very long, I, I just, it's a one and a half hour lecture or something like that. Um, but I think, and as an example, to to have, to have prepared just, just to show the student that yes, that's a uh, that's a path that can be taken, and then and where you can show these different steps. Uh, I think it's definitely an, inter an interesting one. We I didn't have the tools that we have this year uh, last year that I taught it, but maybe this year I will use more that uh, that what what Benji has showed to 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 bring this concept uh, together to the students. Yeah, thanks, uh, Benji. Do you have any final remarks? Uh, it just uh, it, it's it's been such a nice opportunity to to come here and um, give these presentations. I'm really looking forward to the the rest of the talks, um, and uh, it's it's fascinating thinking about how, at least at least in my mind, that the process of putting this presentation together. I've been changing how I think about how we teach the mechanics of a, of soils. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, even one D compression is a little bit complicated one because it has a mean pressure and a shear together. And that's the beauty of the 1D compression as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Our lecture three comes in March 29th. So please join again uh, if you can, and we will continue our this discussion for another three lectures. But then for today, Benji and Francois, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much everyone for joining and then uh, have a good night, good day or a good morning. Goodbye.